All right, welcome to the Spring Butterfly Gardening Seminar. We're glad you're here on this beautiful spring day. Uh, we've got a couple more fun workshops coming up as well next weekend. Anybody have kids, nieces, nephews, grandkids that they like to take places? Next Saturday morning at 10 a.m. sharp, like 10 0 0 0, 0 uh, is the Easter egg hunt. Uh, my, my girls and Kim have been dutifully stuffing up to 3,000 eggs, and so it's uh, kind of fun to see how quickly the children can find 3,000 eggs hidden around the nursery. So uh, that's next Saturday at 10 a.m. The following Saturday, April the 27th, we're doing the fruit tree seminar, one of my favorites. Uh, fruit trees are always fun to uh, grow and harvest from, so that's on April the 27th. So you can check out all of our events online at kirbysnursery.com. Uh, and make sure that you're signed up for our email newsletter and our seasonal mailers as well. Uh, we've got those sign-up sheets over there at the lemonade stand. So did everybody get a handout? That was really more just checking to see that the girls are uh, doing their job properly. Um, so today we're here to talk about butterflies. How many people love butterflies? How many people hate them? We actually had a staff member for a little while who was definitely afraid of butterflies, but she worked to overcome her fear. Uh, but, you know, butterfly gardening is such a cool thing because it really does span all generations. Kids love them. Adults love them. It's just fun to watch them go through their life cycle, to watch them flutter around. I mean, it's such a miracle, isn't it? If you guys watch the transformation on YouTube, right, it's sped up a little bit. And it's so amazing to see kind of a, well, they're not, they're ugly kind of, the caterpillars, right? And this little caterpillar goes, hangs in a chrysalis, and then emerges as this uh, beautiful butterfly. It's pretty cool. We always like to start this workshop as how many of us, to ask a question, how many of you would love to eat whatever you wanted and as much of it as you wanted, take a really long nap, and wake up beautiful? <laughs> I'd go with handsome, but... But unfortunately, that's probably not going to happen for us. But that is the life cycle of a butterfly, right? Uh, they eat us out of house and home when it comes to milkweed. Uh, then they go into that chrysalis, take a little nap, and then they emerge as beautiful butterflies. So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk to you about how to plant your gardens. That's going to be really quick. How to uh, plan your garden is what we're really going to talk about. I've got lots of beautiful plants to show you, uh, to uh, teach you how to make your garden a butterfly magnet where all the neighborhood butterflies will hang out. Uh, so we're going to start with where do you think we should put our butterfly garden? Sun or shade? Sun. Yeah. Butterflies love the sun. Uh, for the most part, you're going to see most of the butterfly activity. Uh, not only when it's warm, butterflies uh, kind of go to sleep a little bit when it's under 65 degrees, I think. Um, they need a little bit of warmth, so they'll go ahead into the sun to dry their wings, get their blood flowing, and be able to fly. Uh, and so that's the, the most uh, activity you're going to see from butterflies is going to be in sunny areas. There's an exception to that. Our state butterfly, the zebra longwing, tends to like some shadier areas. But for the most part, you're going to see the butterflies in sunnier areas. Not only that, uh, but your butterflies are typically um, going to, or your butterfly plants rather, are typically going to like sunny areas as well. That's where you're going to get the most flowers is in sunny areas. Um, and so if you have a choice as to where you put your butterfly garden, the best place for your butterfly garden is going to be in an area that gets at least six hours of sun each day. It could be sun up to sundown, that's fine. Um, but like most plants and people, we all like a little shade at some point during the day. So, uh, you know, six hours is the kind of minimum amount of sun that they would want. Um, and then, you know, it could be all day long, that would be fine. But, uh, but plenty of good bright sun is important for our uh, butterfly gardens. So we want it to be a nice sunny area. But one of the other considerations when you're picking the location, you may not have a lot of choice about this, is to find a spot with as much uh, wild natural habitat as possible. How many people live in like a subdivision? In uh, like just really far away from trees and anything natural? Kind of. So we'll get a question sometimes here. I, I planted all these plants, we did exactly what you told us and I'm just not seeing any butterflies. So my first question back is almost always, well where do you live? Like is it in the middle of a subdivision that they just cleared all the big trees out and brought in all new stuff and it's just kind of uh, young plants, trees, uh, not a lot of wild areas, and usually that ends up being the case. And if that's the case, it may take a while for the butterflies to find your area. Um, the more unnatural, the more wild the habitat, uh, the better off the, uh, the butterflies will do, the more kind of 
uh, hiding spots they'll have, places for sleeping and things like that. We'll talk more about that as we go along. Um, I realize that your HOA is probably not interested in letting you leave the fallen tree down in your yard. Uh, but if you could, that would be ideal. So however close you can get to some sort of a natural area uh, or a little bit of uh, wild or native type of, uh, of landscape, that's going to be better for the butterflies. No, we can't always do it, but it is a little bit better. And of course, when you're picking a spot for your garden, pick somewhere where you can enjoy it, right? Don't tuck it out in the back corner of the yard. Put it somewhere where you can see it. Nothing cooler than being inside, cooking at the kitchen window, and you see the butterflies fluttering on some of your plants or just outside the patio. So put it somewhere where you can enjoy it. This, that's why we're doing it, right? Just to get out there uh, and enjoy all of those great butterflies. So once we've picked a spot for our butterfly garden, a nice sunny area that we can enjoy, uh, we need to plan the garden. Um, and that's what we're gonna talk about here for the most part. Um, is how to plan the garden. Uh, who can tell me the four life cycle stages of the butterflies? You don't have to raise your hand. Just what's the first stage? They're an egg, right? So we're an egg, and after an egg, we're a caterpillar, right? That's their larval stage. After the, uh, that's, yep, yeah, they go into their pupa stage, which is a cocoon, or more specifically for butterflies, we'll call it a chrysalis. Um, and so that's stage number three for the butterfly, and then they emerge as an adult. So those are the four stages, egg, Caterpillar, chrysalis, and adult uh, are the four stages of the uh, butterflies. And uh, what we want to do when we're planning our garden, uh, especially if we want to have butterflies that hang around, is we want to try to plan for each one of those stages uh, of the butterfly's life cycle. Some of them are easier than others. We're going to start with the easy one. Um, and then the other ones just take a little bit more thought uh, just to make sure that we've got some spaces for butterflies to do each of the things they need to do in that life cycle. That way they'll stick around in our yards rather than racing off to the neighbors who have a better place. Um, so we're going to start with the adult butterfly. So to bring adult butterflies to our gardens, what do we need? Flowers. Lots and lots of flowers. So our favorite uh, flower for butterflies is going to be the red penta. If you came up to me and you said, Joey, what is one flower uh, that I can plant for butterflies? And I would say red penta. Not just pentas, but red penta. Uh, something about uh, colors in that red family, reds, oranges, and yellows, um, they can considered the warm colors. They're very attractive to butterflies. There's something instinctive about that from them. Uh, they sort of know that that's going to be a good food source with the uh, particular eyesight that they have. Um, and so red is always a great color to start your butterfly garden with. Now, you'll see lots of blues and purples and different colors up here as well. And the butterflies love to feed on those flowers. So it's not that they don't see other colors, but there just seems to be something about the color red that is really attractive to butterflies. Uh, and hummingbirds too. This isn't a hummingbird class, but most of what we talk about applies to hummingbirds. A lot of the butterfly uh, plants also attract hummingbirds, so that can be an added bonus to your butterfly garden. Uh, so red pentas are one of our favorites, uh, like I said here, but we've got lots to choose from. There's gomfrinas of various sorts that have really cute puffball flowers, great for a variety of pollinators, including your butterflies. Um, another favorite of ours are the salvias. And we've just got one variety here. This is a blue salvia, but we've got different colors of salvias uh, out in our butterfly area. Uh, in, the, uh, in the main nursery. Tropical sage is really pretty. It's a bright red color, um, and that's a really great one for attracting butterflies. What else do we have here that's fun? So here we've got pin cushion flower. Again, cute little purple flowers. Stay, the foliage stays kind of low, and you get those flowers kind of floating up above it. Those are really pretty and uh, kind of compact, uh, so they are great for butterflies in general. We love the whirling butterflies. You'll see them dancing around on there. And as an added bonus, the whirling butterflies have little pink butterfly flowers. So they look like little butterflies. Come check them up a little closer after the workshop. They're a really cool little flower as well for your butterflies. So those, I, there's no possible way I could have brought one of every flower over here to show you. But uh, pentas, salvias, I don't know that we have any lantanas over here, but those are really great. Those are some of our favorite flowers for uh, butterflies for sunny areas. Uh, again, they're not the only ones, but some of our favorites. If you've got a bigger garden, so the one thing I didn't say at the beginning of planning your garden is it does not matter what size your garden is going to be. We can do a container with one penta, and you're likely to find a few butterflies come into it, or we could plant a garden the size of this greenhouse and fill it up with amazing flowers. So it doesn't matter how big or small, we can make sure that you've got butterflies come into your garden. Um, so if you have a larger space, those flowers work for smaller spaces really well because they're just smaller plants. Uh, we've got some great plants for larger spaces. We start with the uh, dwarf firebush. 
which is the dwarf of a really big fire bush, so it still gets four to six feet tall, so it's definitely a very large plant, but it has tubular flowers. It's a great one for hummingbirds as well, um, but also for the butterflies. And the, uh, the one thing you want to think of when you're planning uh, your butterfly garden uh, selection of these plants is to make sure you plant a variety. Um, so just because I said that red pentas are one of our favorite flowers doesn't mean you need all red pentas. We want to provide the butterflies with a variety of different flowers to feed from. There's a couple reasons for that. How many people know, or does anybody know, how many butterflies uh, there are in the state of Florida? Like number of types, not number of butterflies. That would be tough to count, right? Anybody have a guess? Varieties or types of butterflies? More than 10, more than 57. Less than 5,000. It's 180 uh, different identified butterflies that have been uh, found in the state of Florida. So we're a really great place for butterfly gardening as well. Our tropical climate, um, I think combined with uh, just our variety of plants and flowers, uh, leads to a lot of different types of butterflies in our area. Of those 180, about 40 of them are unique to Florida. Uh, so they're found either natively to Florida or mostly within our boundaries. So that does make us a really unique place uh, for butterfly spotting. Um, so with that many different butterflies, are they all the same size? No. No, right? There's really big ones, there's really tiny ones. Um, so there's lots of different sizes of butterflies. And so we plant a variety of flowers, flowers of all different colors, shapes, and sizes, so that each different butterfly has something to uh, feed from. The butterflies feed with a little appendage called a proboscis. It's a little antenna looking thing that they poke into the flower and get nectar with. And each butterfly is a little bit different. Uh, and so having flowers of different sizes and shapes uh, will help feed a whole variety of butterflies in your garden. So make sure you plant a variety. Pick your favorites. The great thing about butterfly gardening is that everything is perennial and everything is colorful. And so whether you're planting just a butterfly garden just for a butterfly garden, or if you just need to fill in your landscape with some pretty plants that also attract butterflies, um, butterfly plants are great for that because for the most part they're perennials, hardy, and all that good stuff. So I showed you the fire bush. We also have a really cool plant that's a variety of the fire bush called lime sizzler. It's got kind of a bright yellow and green leaf to it, which is kind of cool. And then it gets the same color flower as the original fire bush, uh, so it's good for the flowering as well, but it has a little bit of brightness with the foliage there. I can't walk over there and pick them up because my microphone will squeak at us. But we have a few of the butterfly bush bud leas, which uh, are really, really great for the butterflies. Make kind of a mid-sized shrub, and that can be a great part of your butterfly garden. Um, what else do we have here? Oh, who has shade that they're working with? Just a couple of people. So if you don't have a ton of sun, you still might be able to get some butterflies into your garden. Pick the sunniest of the shady spots, so the spot that has the most sunlight. But we do have a couple of plants that are really good for attracting butterflies in shady areas. We'll start with the red fire spike. That's this one here. Can you see the little flower coming up the top there? This is also a phenomenal plant for hummingbirds. Uh, but it is good for shady areas. It'll wilt a lot if it gets too much sun. And it gets kind of big, up to six feet tall or so. But beautiful red flowers throughout the summer months. So that's a great one for shady areas to get some butterflies in. And then on the ground here, we've got uh, dragon wing begonias. The uh, purple Mona lavender. And I can't quite reach it, but there's some red shrimp plants on the far end over here. And all of those are really good plants for shady areas, um, but they also do attract butterflies to some degree. If you walk through our butterfly house, which is on the opposite side of, of the store from where we are here, you'll notice that the whole side of the store is on the north side of our building, which is in shade most of the year and most of the time. Uh, and so on that side, we try to work in some of these plants just to give the butterflies that are in there uh, some food options on that shady side. And you'll find them over there. So like I said about the sun, it's not that they're only in sunny areas, but that's just their kind of happier area or predominant area that you'll tend to find them in. Plus, we get a ton of flowers from plants planted in sunny areas. So that's a selection of some of the great plants for attracting adult butterflies to our garden. And that's always where I tell people to start uh, when you're planting your uh, butterfly garden. You know, if you get out and you just go right to planting a bunch of milkweed plants, 
at some point you don't have a ton of food for those adult butterflies. And so you don't capture that whole life cycle in your garden. So start with these nectar plants and that'll start attracting the butterflies there. So now we're gonna move from the adult uh, part of the life cycle to the egg uh, part of the life cycle. So once we've got the adults in our garden, now we need a place for them to lay their eggs. And that's gonna be a group of plants called host plants. So we refer to the food for the adult butterflies as nectar plants. The food for the caterpillars uh, and where the adults lay their eggs are called host plants. And so butterflies are kind of picky. Anybody else in here a picky eater? No? Oh, that's amazing. Um, but if you were a picky eater, do you think you'd only eat one kind of plant? That's it, I'm just gonna eat one plant. You'd eat a lot, wouldn't you? Lots of plants. So butterflies are so picky that for the most part, especially the most common ones that we see, uh, they tend to eat from one type of plant, and that's it. Um, and so what we're gonna talk about is those types of plants for some of the most common butterflies in Florida. Uh, of course, of that 180 butterflies they call Florida home, a lot of them are ones that we kind of ignore, right? Little tiny white ones, little checkered, little skippers, little brown uh, butterflies. So there's a ton of them that are, well, I, I, I shouldn't insult them and say that they're boring, but, but they just aren't as much fun as the bigger butterflies that are really colorful. So the ones that are more common are what we're going to talk about as far as the host plants today. It's also the case that there's a lot of sources with host plant information for some of those kind of the skippers and the different little butterflies. A lot of them just end up eating a variety of different weedy and wild kind of plants uh, as opposed to like more cultivated plants like we're going to talk about today. So, but your uh, major butterflies that we'll talk about are those big colorful ones that we tend to see and we're going to try to figure out how we can make sure they're a part of your butterfly garden. So we need host plants uh, for all of these different types of butterflies. And so why doesn't somebody tell me one of their favorite butterflies and we'll start there with that host plant. Go, give me a butterfly. Monarch butterfly. Okay, we'll start with monarch. So we have a, uh, a little bit of a surprise for you today. We actually uh, were able to find some native milkweed. Um, so we have some of the swamp milkweed in stock, and that's this guy right here. Uh, there's a hundred different species or so of milkweed, and monarch butterflies lay their eggs, and the caterpillars will only feed on plants in the milkweed family. Um, and so that's one of those really, that matter of belief looks exactly the same as a milkweed. If it's not a milkweed, uh, those caterpillars aren't going to feed from it. Um, and so our example of milkweed here today was the swamp milkweed, and we also have some of the tropical milkweed out in our butterfly section as well. So for monarch butterflies, you want to plant milkweed. How many of you have ever fed and raised some monarch caterpillars before? They eat a lot, don't they? Oh, yeah. They eat a ton, like a teenage boy, right? Um, so they eat an awful lot of uh, milkweed in that kind of journey from egg to adult. Uh, a, and a, a caterpillar through its, uh, what lasts about two weeks, its life cycle, will eat almost an entire milkweed plant. Just one caterpillar. How many eggs do butterflies lay? Hundreds. Each individual butterfly lays hundreds of eggs. Um, and so it's pretty tough to keep your garden stocked with milkweed. Um, that one, uh, some of the other host plants that we'll talk about grow a little bit larger and a little more vigorously, and so they provide a little more food for their caterpillars uh, uh, pests, I guess, if you wanted to call them that. Um, but the milkweed is a little slower to recover. So what I like to do with my milkweed plants is when I'm planting the garden and kind of figuring out how I'm going to lay out all of the flowers and shrubs, is rather than planting a grouping of milkweed, which is what we would usually do with uh, landscape design, right? I kind of intersperse it between all of the other uh, nectar plants. That way when the milkweed has been eaten down to just the stems, I can prune it back and it's hidden behind my pentas or behind my salvia so that you don't see it within the garden. Um, and then it can, uh, can regrow hopefully, uh, although that doesn't hide it from the adults very well. They'll, they'll eat pretty quickly on the young, uh, new tender growth. They think it's yummy. Um, so milkweed is your host plant for monarch butterflies, and monarchs are probably one of the more common ones that we see uh, around in our area. So the next one I'm going to go to is the swallowtail family. And the swallowtails are all really pretty butterflies. They're going to be a combination of blacks and yellows. Um, and the, uh, probably the most common of the swallowtails that we see is just the black swallowtail butterfly. It's about the size of a monarch, um, and it's mostly black with a little bit of yellow. I've got pictures of each one of the butterflies up here, so feel free after the workshop to come up and take a look. It's got a picture of each one of the parts of the life cycle of some of the common butterflies that I'm talking about today. So the host plant for the black swallowtail butterfly can be a little bit of a challenge. How many of you have an herb garden? Mm -hmm. Anybody like parsley? 
Yeah, big fans of parsley. So unfortunately, the black swallowtail is also a really big fan of parsley. So the adults will lay their eggs on plants in the carrot family. And for our herbs, that's most commonly what we would plant. That's going to be dill, fennel, parsley, and rue. So those are the four most common herbs in the carrot family. And that's what the black swallowtails are going to lay their eggs uh, and then the caterpillars are going to feed on. So that can be a little challenging when you've got an herb garden going at the same time. So I've got the four plants here. We've got parsley. Uh, we've got is this one fennel or dill. This is a dill plant here. Rue. This one here. And then fennel looks almost exactly like dill. Hard to kind of tell the difference between the two there. So those are the four herbs. Here's what I kind of like to do. If I really want black swallowtails in my garden, but I also really want an herb garden, um, I will tend to plant rue. And the reason for that is I am hard pressed to find a culinary use for the herb root. Come up and smell it if you don't believe me. It smells a little bit like cat pee. It's not great. Uh, so it doesn't have a whole lot of cooking uses. Um, I believe that uh, in some cultures they make a, a tea out of it for stomach issues. Um, but uh, I figure that with that in mind, it could be kind of my sacrificial plant. The butterflies can, can do what they want with it. So plant rue if you've got a big butterfly garden going. Uh, I mean a big herb garden going and you really want to protect your herbs. My, my, what I try to do is I'll move the caterpillars from the plants I want to the plants that I feel like they can eat uh, so that uh, they're not damaging uh, damaging my plant or just overwhelming it. Because what do we say? Butterflies lay what? Hundreds of eggs. And so even in our herb section, we saw some caterpillars yesterday of the black swallowtails as uh, the first of the season. And so what you'll start to see is like a fennel or a dill plant just covered in you know, 50, 60 eggs as the butterflies kind of make their way from one to the other. Uh, so the nickname of the caterpillar of the black swallowtail butterfly is actually the parsley worm because it's a pest, right? If you're a parsley grower, um, whereas for us as butterfly gardeners, we think of it as a, as a good insect, right? So those are the four herbs for, um, for the black swallowtail butterfly. You can do those in containers as well. Um, so even with my herb garden, sometimes we'll plant our parsley inside our screen area to keep the butterflies off of it. That way the outside herbs can be for the butterflies. That can also be another way to just make sure the uh, butterflies aren't overtaking your herb area. So that's the black swallowtail butterfly. We should start seeing more of those. They're usually a little late in the spring and coming back, um, but they seem like they're making their way now. Like I said, we saw the first eggs on those yesterday. So who has an area where they can plant lots of vines? A big fence or a trellis or something like that? All right. So we've got two butterflies uh, that both use the passion flower uh, as their host plant. Uh, in sunny areas, the Gulf fritillary uh, will lay its eggs on the passion flower. In shady areas, shady areas, the zebra longwing will lay its eggs on the passion flower. So the passion flower vine, let's see if I can reach this one here, I think I can, is this one here. So it's a really vigorous vine. Uh, the flowers aren't open. They're really, really pretty, I promise. They actually look a little bit like the northern clematis vine. Um, there's quite a few different colors. This one's a red. There's a burgundy. There's some purples. And I think we have a few of the native corky stem passion flower as well. Uh, but anything in that passiflora family uh, will be a host for, the, uh, for those two butterflies. Uh, how many people have ever fought with uh, oleander caterpillars before? So the caterpillar of the zebra, I mean of the gulf fritillary, looks almost exactly like the oleander caterpillar, except it won't sting you if you touch it. It's orange with like a little line of spikes down the left and the right side of its body. And then the caterpillar for the zebra longwing looks almost identical, except that it's white in color instead of orange. Um, so those are two kind of cool caterpillars. Uh, I mentioned it before when I was going through the some of the uh, original butterflies, but zebra longwing is the state butterfly of Florida. Uh, it's one of my favorites. The, the Gulf fritillaries are kind of a smaller than the monarch orange butterfly. It flies really, really fast through the air, so they kind of move quickly. The zebra longwing has just long, narrow wings, uh, really beautiful black wings with a yellow stripe, and it just flutters really slowly. Uh, we have a huge viburnum hedge in our backyard, and I uh, allowed a passion vine to grow a little bit too wild into it. And uh, it was actually kind of cool because not only did our viburnum hedge look like it was blooming, uh, but because it was all tucked into the shade, we ended up with just 20, 30 uh, zebra longwing butterflies that as you walked along a path we have would just flutter near you as they were laying eggs on the, uh, the passion flower. So that can be a really cool one. You could plant the same vine, the passion flower, and direct some of the branches towards shady areas, some of the branches towards sunny areas. 
um, and you would get the same effect. It doesn't have to be a different plant for the two butterflies to lay their eggs on it. It just is the sun and the shade just tends to be the areas that they favor. Uh, but you do need a lot of room for passion vine to grow, so make sure that you have a trellis, a fence, an arbor, uh, or something like that for it to grow on. Now we'll talk about the Dutchman's pipe vine. And if you thought you need a lot of room for the passion vine, you need a super duper lot of room for the Dutchman's pipe vine. There's one on the very left, your right uh, side of the uh, area there. It's got a cool flower on it. So it's a very, very unique flower that's on the Dutchman's pipe vine. Uh, it is the host plant for two butterflies in the swallowtail family as well. And that is going to be the pipe vine swallowtail and the polydamus swallowtail. Uh, both of those, I, the, uh, they both look very, very similar. But the, uh, I want to say it's a pipe vine swallowtail. It's a smaller swallowtail, mostly black with a little iridescent blue, uh, especially when it folds its wings up. So not solid blue, but just a little blue if you catch the sun just right off of the wings. Uh, they're both really pretty butterflies. The caterpillars, are, they look like monsters. They're just these ugly brown caterpillars with weird reddish spikes on them. Um, and they are hands down the most wasteful uh, butterfly that, that you'll ever meet. So monarchs, I mean, they eat every leaf of milkweed you give them pretty much, right? Yeah. As long as the milkweed doesn't dry up, for the most part, they eat everything that's on that plant. The, uh, the swallowtail or the pipe vines, they will nibble at the tip of a leaf or like towards the stem. They'll get through it, drop the leaf on the ground and go to the next leaf. So they make a, a fairly big mess. I feel like I've talked to you out of planting a uh, pipe vine at this point. Um, <laughs> But to make sure you have a lot of space, the great thing is that pipe vine is a really vigorous grower. And so it recovers very quickly uh, from any of that damage that they do. But they are kind of wasteful. And the butterflies themselves seem to lay the eggs in uh, what seem to be a lot of clusters. So as whereas on a milkweed, we tend to see one egg on each leaf. They don't usually see clusters of eggs. The uh, swallowtail butterflies will just, you know how vines make those little tendrily curls? I mean, the curl will just be loaded with eggs all over that the piece. So they seem to lay them in huge clusters. So there's always this gaggle of caterpillars. I don't know what the collective noun term is for caterpillars. So we'll go with that. Um, so huge numbers of caterpillars that, uh, that uh, they get on those plants. But uh, fortunately, the plants are bigger, they're faster uh, growing, and so they recover pretty quickly as well. So I know I'm missing some other great butterflies. I skipped around all the swall swallowtail family, didn't I? So anybody have citrus trees in their yard? So if you have citrus trees or you have space for a little citrus tree, the citrus trees are host plants to the one of the most beautiful butterflies, which is the giant swallowtail. So it's the big guy, the really big one you see flying around with a real bright yellow. Uh, it's a little bit blacker when it closes its wings, but then when it opens up like a, a real bright yellow on the back of its wings. And um, so the giant swallowtail lays its eggs on uh, the citrus trees. They tend to cluster towards the new growth because obviously old leaves are a little bit tougher. But that new growth is really tender and that's where you'll tend to find them clustered. Does anybody know what the caterpillars look like? Oh, you need to sign up for the Kirby social, social media feed, uh, feeds. They do, a lot of them spit out the little tongue when you touch them and the giant does that, but it looks like something really specific. It does look like bird poop, that's exactly right. We're talking about poop a lot. If you read my newsletter this week, my daughter's wearing her poop shirt today, so um, go check that out. Uh, so in the picture of it's on the uh, sign up here as well. So it camouflages itself by just looking like a bird dropping. And if you were to walk past kind of quickly a citrus tree, you would just see, you, you would just think that that's what was on the tree. Uh, so it's a really interesting way that it manages to camouflage itself. The fortunate thing about the giant swallowtail, kind of like the, uh, the passion vine and the pipe vine, is that the caterpillars will feed on leaves, which can be a test if you're trying to grow citrus. Uh, but for the most part, um, they don't damage the tree in any of, uh, a way that harms the tree in kind of irreparably. So they're, they're, pretty, uh, they're pretty good uh, to share with you uh, for the citrus tree. So if you have some space in your garden, you're looking to get all of the butterflies in, plant a citrus tree, and that'll help bring the giant swallowtails in. And the final big group of butterflies, it looks like somebody came to join us. Isn't that nice? Which one is that? Oh, I forget the name of it. I shouldn't admit that, right? I should just make something up. <laughs> it's obviously a white butterfly. But I don't think it's the cabbage white, and it's not the checkered white. Um, and it's not a white peacock either. We'll look it up after. Um, so the... Uh, it might actually be for the white sulfurs. Um, so the family we were just about to talk about of butterflies are the sulfur butterflies. And those are gonna be the real bright yellow ones uh, that you tend to see flying around. Um, I think that that little white one might be in the sulfur family as well. 
and uh, they feed or they lay their eggs and then the caterpillars feed on plants in the cassia or senna family. Um, so there's a couple of different varieties of those plants. We've got one over here, it's a desert cassia, which makes a cute little tree. And uh, so that can be a really nice one to have. Most of the cassias get pretty big, so good size to them. And so you do want to make sure that, uh, that you've got some space to grow the cassia trees. Again, like milkweed really, milkweed and the herbs are the two challenging ones where the caterpillars will really eat most of the plant. All of these other trees and bushes uh, tend to recover pretty quickly from caterpillar feeding. So that kind of, I don't think I missed any other butterflies that are really common for our area. So those are the really common butterflies that we find, and those are the host plants um, that will, uh, you know, bring those butterflies to your garden. So we talked about the adult, we're gonna plant nectar plants. We've given them a place to lay their eggs now uh, in the form of those host plants. So that also is gonna skip us over the next part of the life cycle, which is the caterpillar, because obviously that's the portion of the life cycle um, where they'll feed on those plants as well. And then the final part of our uh, journey through this butterfly life cycle is gonna be the chrysalis form. And so uh, one consideration when you're planting your garden in this case isn't specifically going to be plants, but it's gonna get back to that idea of making sure you've got some wild areas uh, for your uh, butterflies and your caterpillars to do all of the parts of their life cycle. One part of that is making a chrysalis. So where do you guys think that uh, butterflies, or caterpillars rather, like to go to make their chrysalis? How many, raise your hand if you think they like to do it on the plant they ate from. Have you guys been to this workshop before? Uh, or how many people think that they're gonna go really far and find some hidden spot to do it? God, just have a lot of people that won't answer the question. Come on, guys. Hidden spot, but not the um, So they will not usually make a chrysalis on the host plant they've been feeding on. That's not absolute. You'll find them on the host plants every now and then. But one of the biggest questions we get from customers is, I had a caterpillar and it was really big on my milkweed yesterday. It's gone today. Where did it go? And of course our answer is, well, probably went to chrysalis, just somewhere where you can't find it. Um, because that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to hide, they're trying to get away from predators, find a spot that's safe and protected to make their chrysalis. So I'd say that at least 95% of the time, you're not gonna find a, a caterpillar making its chrysalis on um, the plant that it was feeding from. Especially in the case of milkweed, a lot of us are raising monarch butterflies. They wanna go off somewhere else. Milkweed is kind of a, a floppy plant, it's kind of loose. And so to the caterpillar, it's not an ideal spot to have a secure place uh, free of the wind uh, to make its chrysalis. Um, and so they will go a really, really long way uh, to make their chrysalis. I've seen them go 30, 40, 50 feet away from where we kind of know that they were at one uh, spot to make their chrysalis in some very strange places. Um, so if you have a butterfly garden that's near your house, look up on your house and you'll tend to find them hanging from the gutters at some point, uh, different spots if there's a little perch under a window sill or something like that. Um, but uh, so what we wanna make sure we've got in our butterfly garden and just kind of in our lawn or landscape generally is some trees or shrubs, bushes, something for them to go find some cover, find some protection and go into that chrysalis stage. They are looking to be protected because unfortunately uh, there are a, a lot of uh, predators for caterpillars, butterflies, um, and things like that. So they're looking to find the most hidden spot away from birds, away from lizards, away from wasps, as much as possible, um, so that they can keep away from some of those predators. So don't be afraid if you saw a whole bunch of big fat caterpillars yesterday, and they're gone today, that's pretty normal. Um, of course, there may be some predators that got to them, but for the most part, they've usually gone and found a place to make their chrysalis, uh, and then uh, they'll hang there for a few weeks, and then they'll emerge uh, as a big butterfly. You know, I've had people ask questions about whether or not you could build something uh, for the butterflies to go into chrysalis. I've never seen anything that really works. There's no way to specifically attract them to something um, so that they will make their chrysalis in a particular spot. So what we notice in our butterfly house is that they just do it on all the wood. And so underneath the wood, you'll just you'll see the old remnants of old chrysalis or new ones hanging there. So just anywhere where there's a piece of wood. So it's always possible that you could build a little wooden civil structure that would maybe get them to go up it if it was nice and secure and they felt like it was protected they might use that as a spot uh, for making their chrysalis. Um, so that goes with that idea of keeping the area a little bit wild. Um, that pretty much has carried us through the life cycle of the butterfly there. Um, but uh, at, at along with talking about uh, keeping things on the wild side, it's really important for the adult butterflies as well. 
Uh, what do you think butterflies do each night? Like it gets a little bit cooler. They go to sleep, they rest. It's not quite a sleep, they don't have eyelids, so they don't close their eyes. But they do have to go to, into a state of kind of semi, uh, dormancy is not the right word, but we'll use it, uh, where they're just, they're resting through the night. They'll find a leaf to hang underneath, uh, a branch or something secure, and then they'll, they'll rest all night long, especially when it's cooler, uh, and then until the temperatures warm up in the morning, they're not going to become active again. So along that line of keeping the area a little bit wild, uh, we want spots for not just the caterpillars to make a chrysalis, but also for those adult butterflies uh, to find some uh, protection uh, and safety through uh, each night. Um, all of these little things I'm talking about are all the pieces that are going to make those butterflies stick around because if the adults feel safe and they can have a place to rest each night, the uh, caterpillars feel safe, they have a place to make a chrysalis, um, then a lot of that life cycle action will happen in your garden if you plan for it. Okay, what else do adult butterflies need besides food? Uh, they actually need a little bit of mineral and water. Uh, so one of the other things you can do in your garden if you're not near uh, a lot of wild areas is give them a spot to uh, get some of the minerals that they need. And they do it through a process called puddling. Uh, there's some really cool pictures of it online if you search for it, of just huge numbers of butterflies together uh, on what's really just a wet sand. So you don't need a water, like a water bowl or anything like that. They don't go for water, but they go for damp soil and rocks. Um, they'll kind of uh, set on those, and that's where they'll uh, get some of those minerals from. So you could use an old bird bath, uh, or what I brought up here as an example is just an old saucer. Fill it with a little bit of gravel, maybe some dirt or sand from the yard, and just make sure that it's damp. And that damp dirt and uh, rocks will help them collect some of those minerals that they need. So that could be something to add into your garden. They'll also puddle on uh, wet logs and things like that. So if you have a fountain or a little pond area, they'll sometimes use that as a place to do their puddling. And even then it goes to that kind of wild idea, keeping that area a little bit wild. Old branches and stumps and logs, as they get damp with our Florida rains and the uh, evening humidity, uh, will stay a little bit damp. And those also provide a little bit of minerals and nutrients for those adult butterflies. So another benefit to uh, keeping your area a little bit wild. How many people are gonna go home and try to challenge their HOA? Yeah, no? I think they just, I don't know if in Florida they did it, but somewhere they passed a law it said that an HOA couldn't stop you from uh, doing vegetable gardens in your front yard. I think we need to push for some legislation for a butterfly garden in the front yard, right? Joey at Kirby's Nursery said it's a good idea to leave trees falling down, so we're just going to leave them right here. Okay, so real quickly to finish up the seminar here, I'm going to go through planting and caring for all of these plants. I promise I won't overdo it uh, because most of these plants are pretty easy to take care of. But to start with, we want them to grow their best. So we want the most flowers, the most new growth from our host plants. And so to do that, we want to make sure that they get started really well. And to start a new plant, we're going to start with really great soil. So I brought two of our favorite soils up here today. The first is our custom blended Kirby's planting soil that comes in these black bags here. And it's a great mix of uh, decomposed vegetation. It's got new peat in it so that it has active microbes. Just a really rich mix for getting everything off to a good start. How many of you have really rich soil right out in your backyard? Two people, three people. You're very, very lucky. Because most of us don't. <laughs> most of us have really sandy soil, right? That's pr probably the most common condition in our area. And while sand is good because it drains really well, it doesn't hold a lot of nutrients up for the plants to get anything from. And it almost dries out too quickly. With our hot sun in the summer, uh, it can dry plants out even when they're, we're getting more regular rains. So start with a good soil, mix it half and half in the planting hole, and that'll get all of your new plants off to a really good start. So when to start with planting, make sure we do that well from the get-go, and we'll have plants that just root in more deeply and more help, uh, with a little bit of a healthier, stronger root system. And especially for the host plants, things like your milkweed, it'll make them recover more quickly uh, as the caterpillars start to eat uh, the leaves. Uh, in there kind of as we get into the prime of butterfly season. So we want to plant really well. And then the second thing, I can't believe I haven't said this word in the entire seminar yet. It's like the most important thing you can do for new plants. What do you think it is? Water. 99% of the problems we have here at the nursery, calls that we take are that people didn't water their plants right. We can never say that because nobody likes to hear that. Um, but uh, you've got to water your plants. Uh, so for new plants, and especially some of these smaller flowers or the smaller herbs of the butterfly plants, we're going to water daily for the first month. At what time of the day? Morning. Always in the morning. Always, always, always in the morning. Uh, so daily for the first month, every other day for the second month, and about twice a week for the third month. 
to keep that butterfly garden happy, I probably wouldn't go less than twice a week. Good, deep waterings. Um, so I said good watering, and that doesn't really mean anything. The important thing there is a deep watering. So don't just get out there with the hose and shower, shower, and be done. We want deep waterings. We want that water going all the way through the root system. We want it going beyond a little bit as well. And that's going to encourage roots to grow out into that new soil, that new planting hole that you've created. So we want to make sure that we're watering really deeply for each one of our plants. Uh, and do make sure you water in the morning. Since everybody answered morning, I'm not going to give you the big night versus morning lecture. Uh, but you do want to make sure uh, that they wa get watered in the morning. Plants want water when the sun is up and they're making food. So that's the best time of day to water uh, for all of your plants. Um, so we're going to plant them well, we're going to water them well, and then we also want to fertilize our butterfly gardens. Again, we want lots of flowers, we want a lot of, lots of flowers to recover, uh, and we want the plants to recover with those leaves really quickly. Two of our favorite fertilizers, one's going to be our Kirby Special, it's our custom blended soil, our, Cur our custom blended fertilizer, our Kirby's 848. Uh, that's a great easy way, you just sprinkle it onto the top of each plant, a teaspoon for these gallon sized plants, a tablespoon for some of the larger plants. Do that once a month for the growing season, which will be spring through the kind of, when it stops being warm, which could be next spring or it could be November, it always varies a little bit. Um, but monthly, especially in the first year, and then in subsequent years you can do it spring, summer, and fall to give them a nice boost. It has slow release nitrogen in it, so it releases over a longer period of time. But especially for new plants, small root system, eventually that fertilizer is just beyond their systems there. And then the second way that we like to fertilize, uh, it's a Fox Farm, it's a liquid fertilizer. You can do it as a soil drench or as a kind of a foliar spray over the leaves. And it's a good rich mix. I want to say it has earthworm castings, bat guano, all sorts of cool natural stuff really boosts the plants really nicely. Uh, so that can be a really nice supplement for your garden, especially if your uh, flowers are needing a little extra boost or maybe your host plants need to grow a little bit more. That could be a great way to get the leaves coming out really nicely uh, on your plants. So the final thing we'll talk about for caring for our butterfly gardens is pest control. And it's a little bit of a challenging topic because what are butterflies? They're bugs. Well, we don't have to call them pests. Um, but they are bugs, and the plants certainly that they're feeding from are going to consider them pests, especially the caterpillar stage. Um, and so pest control is really challenging on our butterfly gardens. Um, if you're planning on putting a butterfly garden in, two things to think about are, do you have your home treated for termites, and do you have your home or garden treated for bugs generally? Because most of the time the products used for those will also be harmful to the butterflies. Um, and so it's just something to think about. It's, uh, if a lawn treatment company is uh, treating really close to your butterfly garden, you just want to might, might want to make sure that they're using stuff that's a little bit safer um, because the same pesticides that control bugs on our lawns are also going to control it on our butterfly plants. So you want to be careful with that. Um, not a lot that will spray. Probably the biggest uh, challenge we see in our butterfly gardens is on our milkweed plants. Uh, two pests that get on the milkweed plants that you'll see are the yellow aphids and then the beetly looking bugs. They're the um, kind of orange and black bugs. They're just called milkweed bugs. Um, neither one is harming the caterpillars or the eggs. Uh, for the most part, the milkweed bugs feed up towards the top near the flower, uh, the, the um, seed pods. And then the aphids are just looking for, you know, attaching to some of the newer leaves. So they don't tend to harm the butterflies or caterpillars themselves, but certainly they're competing for a food source. Uh, and at some point they can make the plant decline to a point, if the plants find milkweed bugs and aphids and caterpillars, it's tough for the milkweed to make a recovery. Um, again, tough to treat because we're not going to spray a harsh pesticide on our butterfly gardens. Um, but if you get to the point where the aphids are so bad, uh, there's a couple things you can do pinch off big pieces and just throw them away. Don't let them fall on the ground, put them in a bag, throw them into the trash so you just get rid of a whole population of aphids. Um, if you know that the plants are free and clear of caterpillars or eggs, you can always spray in the evening with something like a neem oil, it's just a topical uh, insecticide that will hopefully slow the, um, the aphids down a little bit. What I would probably do is spray at night and then wash off in the morning, and then that should make the plant safe again for uh, the butterflies. You could do the same with something like a soapy water, um, but you do have to be careful with those because a butterfly or a caterpillar coming in contact with a high concentration of either soapy water or neem oil, it could be harmful to the caterpillar as well. So we do have to be careful with that. Um, lastly, for the aphids, at this time of the year, we can't carry them in the summertime, uh, but right now we do have ladybugs, 1,500 in a cup, don't open them in your car, uh, or you will find them for a long time in your car. Um, 
but you won't have aphids in your car, which is a good thing. Um, so ladybugs eat uh, aphids primarily, that's one of their favorite foods, but then they'll also eat mealybugs, spider mites, thrips, any kind of small insect. So ladybugs are a great natural control. Uh, with my two little girls, we've actually released some. Our apple trees had aphids and our pepper plants. Uh, and it's been cool to see the ladybugs kind of uh, hovering around uh, in those areas, feeding on those ladybugs, so, I mean, on the aphids. So that can be a great way to, um, to control some of those bugs uh, naturally, a natural pest control for your butterfly gardens. Let's see. I think that that was just about everything uh, I wanted to say. Um, hopefully I gave you some great information for organizing and planning your butterfly garden. As I said, I didn't give you the whole list of uh, host or nectar plants, rather. There's tons and tons of them. Pick what you like to look up. There's, butterflies will come to almost any flower for the most part, uh, but some of the ones we gave you on the list are some of the best ones. What I would say for planting that garden, especially if you're new to it, is start with the nectar plants, get some of those planted, and then start adding post plants for the butterflies that you see in your garden area. Um, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to invest in a bunch of citrus trees if you're looking for giant swallowtails and you don't have any in your yard. So start with uh, milkweed. Most of us have monarchs. You see some of the black swallowtails, add host plants as you go along, and that'll bring more and more butterflies into your garden and keep them hanging around. And the last thing, don't forget to keep a little bit of a wild area somewhere in that yard, somewhere so that the butterflies have some protection, some safety, and some places to go. And I am sure that your yards will be the favorite of the entire neighborhood.